One of the things the Guelph letter bomber did prior to sending actual bombs was that he launched lawsuits against people. These were frivolous. When he wanted to launch another frivolous and, as his lawyer put it, ridiculous lawsuit, and his lawyer said no, he sent a bomb to the lawyer. One of the things that a lot of people don't realize is that being litigious is a threat indicator. This applies to more than just actual lawsuits. It can be workplace complaints and other ways of using systems and resources to reach their goals. Now, I'm not talking about legitimate complaints and lawsuits here. I'm talking about frivolous or spurious complaints. If you know someone who is constantly suing someone or threatening to sue, or is constantly launching formal workplace complaints, especially if the complaint is over something that's merely trifling, that tells you to look further and be on guard. When you see that, look for other indicators and look for the motivation. When people hear about lawsuits, they think that getting money is the goal. Most of the time, even in legitimate suits, money is not the goal. Understanding the motivation behind the complaint is key to assessing what's really happening. An example I've seen a lot of is where a stalker is ordered by the court to have no contact with a victim or is otherwise prevented from interacting with their target. The stalker's tactic can turn to using systems to force engagement with the victim. So they'll take the victim to court for something or launch a formal complaint so the victim has no choice but to deal with the stalker. In those cases, any previous stalking behavior should be brought to the attention of authorities involved in the case, whether that be human resources, a judge, or justice of the peace, or a lawyer. Some subjects, when I say subject, I mean the person posing the threat, will use the system to silence people. The threat or perceived threat of a lawsuit or other formal action silences victims and witnesses and allows the subject to continue with his or her abusive behavior unchecked. Some will use the system as a way to punish. They didn't get what they wanted, so they used the system to get revenge. If you are the target or the lawyer, or HR professional, figure out what the motivation is before you decide on how you're going to respond. If you're dealing with a subject who you even suspect is using the system for something other than what it's intended for, don't stonewall, and for heaven's sake, don't get caught in a lie. Those two things will escalate the problem quickly. Some people file complaints, launch launch suits, write letters, join causes and protests, not because they actually care about the issues at hand, but because they feed on outrage. Anger is a powerful physical feeling. Personally, I find it exhausting, and you might too, but some people like that feeling of anger. It energizes them and makes them feel alive. They simply like being in a fight. Most of the time, it's just annoying and tiring for those around them. But it is an indication that that trait is there. Also ask yourself, does this person have limits? When you see an activist blow up a clinic or derail a train or some other violent action, You're not seeing someone who is so passionate about their cause that they go to this great length. The cause they claim to be fighting for is their excuse, their justification for taking destructive or lethal action. It's really about their anger, their injustice collecting, their arrogance. Most people, even those passionate about their cause, will stop before they're at the point 
where they might kill another person. Wound collectors and people who feed on outrage are dangerous. If you are a human resource professional and you have a chronic complainer, ask yourself, what happens if I give this person what they want? Are they satisfied? Wound collectors and outrage feeders are never satisfied. There will always be one more thing they want or something that isn't quite good enough or some other cause that they move on to. Now, this is going to sound counterintuitive. But being sued or complained about can be a good thing. It often, not always, but often, means the subject is still on a path of legal action rather than illegal or violent action. A lot of people who are targets of this will feel relieved when the court hearing or complaint process is over and they think, well, it's over, time to move on. But it's not over. The point at which the subject loses his or her case is actually dangerous. A door has been closed to them, a path blocked, so they find another way. If you're involved with something like this, the time to increase your security is before it looks like the subject is going to lose, and the time to be the most vigilant is when he or she realizes they've lost, especially if they've lost custody of a child, a significant other, or their job. Let's talk about the subject's focus. We've already discussed how the Guelph letter bomber was focused on perceived injustice, perceived wrongs and slights, but there's more. He had an unusual interest in poisons and lethal weapons. A writer or a doctor researching poisons isn't anything to be alarmed about. Mike the mechanic being focused on how to poison people is maybe some cause for questions. Remember to consider context and motivation. Take, for example, someone interested in war. One person might be interested because they're interested in history or how it was that a war came about, and thus how to prevent another one, or how different strategies work. You get the idea. That person isn't displaying a focus to be concerned about. Contrast that with someone interested in war because they enjoy the gore, or they fancy themselves some kind of warrior. And a guy who fantasizes about being a warrior who is also an outrage feeder, is going to be a big problem without protective factors in place for him. These are just examples. Look for what they're focused on, why, how much they're invested, and if it's rooted in reality. Back to the Guelph letter bomber. Becker had previously called the police about him. Arnott had wanted to acquire M16 machine guns and a grenade launcher and asked Becker where he might be able to get those things. Becker reported this to the police. I have two things to say about this one. The victim was smart and called police. Even though the police couldn't do anything with the information at the time, it put the bomber on their radar years in advance, and this information was useful later. Very often, people will hear things like this or see it on social media and laugh it off or minimize it. Don't. If someone is trying to get a freaking rocket launcher, report it. The second thing is that the bomber did not like this. Narcissists and psychopaths do not want you to recognize them for what they are. It's a bad idea to confront them on it if that's not your job. Get help with that. If they know that you know, they may see you as an obstacle or a problem that they have to overcome, and they're not going to ask nicely for you to get out of their way. The Guelph letter bomber actually started his bombing in Toronto. He sent two bombs in Toronto before he sent one to Guelph. The target in Guelph 
was the guy who called the police on him about the weapons and also managed a property from which the subject was evicted. Being unable to take any responsibility for himself, the bomber blamed the victim for the eviction. When the police finally surrounded his car and took him down, he was on his way back to Guelph with bombs in the vehicle to finish the job on that victim in Guelph because the guy didn't die as a result of the first bomb, he said. That police takedown in Toronto likely saved the life of the Guelph man. That brings us to another indicator. Travel. The Guelph letter bomber traveled from Toronto to Guelph to deliver a bomb. When it didn't achieve the intended result, he was prepared to travel again. This is in spite of not having a car. He rented one. You see this indicator with stalkers even before they do anything physically harmful. If someone is traveling a distance to get access to their target, it's a red flag. The further they have to travel and the more difficult it is, the larger the red flag. This behavior warrants a fuller assessment every time. If, for example, you broke up with someone and they live an hour away and they are suddenly, coincidentally, in your neighborhood, put your guard up and document it. The same with an employee you fired who lives far away and is now showing up at the restaurant everyone goes to for lunch. Next time, I'm going to cover taking the victim stance. I enjoy your comments and questions and appreciate you spending time listening. Trust your gut. See you next time.